Hey Tobi, what do you want to do today? Exactly the same as every day, Bibi. We will conquer the world. Hmm, but we already did that yesterday, didn't we? Really? Then, well, what about talking about creativity? Cars can't fly? We show you that with creativity, everything is possible and that this wonderful ability is in every single one of us. Listen now and learn more about your personal creative ability and its importance for you, for organizations and for society. So, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of our podcast, Talking Creativity. Today, we are exploring the fascinating interplay of creativity and diversity, and we are beyond thrilled to have a pod guest joining us all the way from the wonderful city of Copenhagen in Denmark. Our guest is a leader with an extraordinary background in diversity, equity and inclusion, and she's also a visionary in shaping organizational culture and strategic HR. Now, throughout her career, our guest has been at the forefront of exciting initiatives where she is challenging outdated practices and introducing innovative strategies to create a more welcoming and supportive work environment for all. That sounds lovely. As the Global Head of Diversity, Equity, Inclusion and Culture at WS Audiology, she currently leads the charge in fostering a workplace that embraces diversity in its truest sense. So she actively encourages open dialogue and collaboration among leaders and colleagues, emphasizing inclusivity for all perspectives. And Toby, I would speak for both of us that we think this is outstanding and this deserves a really special appreciation. At this point, maybe we can have a round of applause virtually in this podcast. <laughs> so I can't wait to hear more about this and not just a buzzwords. So without further ado, join me in extending a very warm virtual welcome for this time to our special guest, the Global Head of Diversity, Equity, Inclusion and Culture <laughs> at WS Audiology in Copenhagen. Hello and welcome, Caroline, Carolina Clark. Nice to have you in the podcast. Wow, what an introduction. My goodness, you made me sound so good. Uh, I need to rethink my title because it was very long. Um, thank you for having me. It's an honor. And I've been looking forward to this discussion for a long time now. So uh, very happy to be here with you. Wonderful. So should we directly jump into what we want to talk about today? Yes. As always, go now, right in. The first question... Actually, do you have like a, how is it, nickname? Is it, do you, uh, do all the people call you Car Carolina or Carol or Care? Actually, people, it's a combination. So uh, majority of people will call me Carolina. And the funny thing is, so when I lived in Poland, everyone called me Karo. So that's just like how you would, you know, You know, give, it's not a nickname, maybe, but a shorter version of my name. But in Denmark, people like to use the whole name. So that's okay. where I, uh, you know, went from Karo to Carolina. And then we, I have colleagues calling me K because it's just too long for them to even pronounce. <laughs> can can we call you KC so, today? Because Carolina Clark is a Casey. nice KC. Yeah. That's a Casey, nice nickname. Please do. It's, uh, it's a nice <coughs> it's, <one>. Yes. <laughs> absolutely. But it's just, so I got my fourth nickname. See? <laughs> actually shocking oh. that people get so lazy that they can't not even pronounce the whole name they just say k <laughs> yeah but carolina is just yeah. like it's very long yeah. so <laughs> okay we'll in call you defense, casey but yeah. so we already casey, tried sure. to be creative in this group here and the podcast is, is as it as the name is stating already it's all about creativity so the most important question is for you casey um what is what is creativity for you mm -hmm. to you whatever What is it? Easy question, I know. So, yeah, I wish it was an easy question. But so creativity to me, it is all about courage um, to explore the unknown. Mm -hmm. But I'm just not talking about, you know, the thoughts or ideas in your head. But I'm also talking about actions that we put behind those thoughts, dreams, ideas. Mm -hmm. So in my view, if you have ideas but you don't act on them, mm -hmm. you are imaginative, but you are not creative. Mm -hmm. So that is my uh, version of 
creativity. Perhaps you have PhDs, so you probably have a better <laughs> definition. <laughs> I don't. But that's what I've been telling myself. <laughs> No, that's wonderful. I mean, it's not about a correct like definition, but it's about this podcast is about perspectives, right? Having a lot of diverse perspectives on the same topic. That's what we want to deliver. It's not about finding the one single best answer. There will never be any uh, like a single best answer anyway. So uh, that's wonderful. So you think it's like imagination plus acting on it. I like that picture. Actually. Yes. Mm -hmm. So you need action behind yeah. it so that you call it creative Yeah. yeah, because I think to me, there is a difference between being creative and imagining things, yeah. right? Because if you don't put action behind your, That's right. you know, thoughts, nothing goes, so there is no innovation. You're just perhaps innovating in your head, but it's, you know, there is no real outcome. So I think that's why I feel that way. Mm -hmm. I like that. But if you look into your life, Carolina, also like probably mm -hmm. the, the last couple of years, but also what you're doing right now. What were your like touch points regarding the topic of creativity? Have you been always a very creative person in your life? Was that a topic that you didn't like in the beginning, but you changed your perspective on that? What's mm. the role in, uh, of creativity in your life? Uh, what would you say? So the role of creativity in my life um, has been very um, mixed, I would say. So uh, I have never considered myself creative. Why? Honest. Yeah, why? Um, well, let me, let me explain this. So I, um, I grew up in a very creative environment. Mm -hmm. So I, uh, I was surrounded since I was a kid by daring, creative, gifted people with crazy ideas. Um, so they saw world and, you know, problem solving, they had problem solving skills I didn't have myself. Mm -hmm. So that's the reason why I decided, okay, well, mm -hmm. I'm not creative. However, I also realized very, very early that, and that's the reason why for my, you know, there is the reason why for my definition of creativity, I realized that my creativity comes into play where there is a need to act on an idea. Mm -hmm. And that's where I found find creative ways of bringing that to life. Mm -hmm. So for me, the most natural thing is to surround myself with very creative people. It's just, I'm just drawn to those environments and those people that allow me to help them, you know, structure their ideas and bring them to life and being creative in that way. Uh, so that is the reason why I feel that creativity like that has two parts. Yeah. Um, so, um, yeah, so that's basically my little story. <laughs> Have you also discovered any things in your life which you would consider as something that hinders you regarding being creative or anything that like supports you in being creative? Can be whatever it is, can be a person, can be a behavior, something of someone uh, uh, like a mm. saying or like a condition, mm. an emotion, mm. a circumstance, whatever it is. Uh, so what... Um so what stops me, if I can answer the first question, so what stops me from being creative? Mm -hmm. Well, sometimes it's, well, most of the time, it is myself. So, you know, daily routine, uh, deadlines, stress for periods. I'm a very um, structured person. That's my personality. So this is where I limit myself because I feel like, okay, I have to deliver. So uh, that's that's one part. And the other part, if I am not exposed to creative people or people that are uh, different than myself, that's also where my, you know, creativity goes down. Uh, mm -hmm. So, so I would say I, um, I need people around me to mm -hmm. stimulate my creative muscle uh, and uh, yeah, and interesting, diverse environments, I think. So that is what enables me mm -hmm. to, to start being creative. Do you actively do that? Like, do you really consciously think about it and maybe also create kind of routines or anything in that direction to actively seek out to people, for example, in a certain environment or whatever? I do. So my whole career uh, has been around, evolved around people. So I have 10 years of experience within HR. So I'm constantly around people because I am so aware of my need to be, you know, around, uh, around different, different, you know, personalities, different people, if I can put it that way. 
And because as a child, I was, well, I, I'm born into a very creative family. Um, I always subconsciously picked friends, partners who are also very creative. So I am very fortunate um, to live with very creative individuals. So uh, like my husband, are you creative? Okay, then. <laughs> <laughs> no, Let's that's go. my unconscious bias. I think you know. I just like I'm just drawn to to those <laughs> towards those people. Um, so um, yeah. So actually, so so the way I practice it. So. For example, privately at home, I, uh, my husband is extremely creative and, you know, just being around him, uh, really allows me to step, you know, um, away from the routine and my need for checklists and just, you know, gives, he gives me the room to just like, you know, exercise my creative muscle and, uh, also spending time with my daughter. And oh, you sorry. give you give the structure to your husband then, like is that like a back and forth thing? Like, do you also help him with a little bit more of this? Because you you mentioned that you're a rather structured person, right? Yeah, yeah, I am a structured person. So, uh, actually, I think the two of us are really creative together. We are very mm -hmm. different. Um, so he gets those ideas that are out of this world and this is where my creativity comes in because I try to make that happen mm -hmm. so uh, um, for example we have recently so it's our side project we have tons of side projects <laughs> on our jobs I like that. Um, <laughs> we built um, we decided you know there is the strength of uh, sustainable living and you know building with sustainable materials and being in nature things like that And I'm not a nature person, to be very honest, but mm -hmm. I thought, okay, why not? Let me try. So we decided to build a teeny tiny house in the middle of nowhere. Oh, wow. uh, we bought a piece of land, basically a wood. So it's like, you know, it's in the middle of nowhere. We haven't even seen it. So we just bought it <laughs> uh, in the northern part of, uh, of Denmark. And we, and we said, okay, and we want to build this teeny tiny house, like 36 square meters in the middle of the woods and we want to build it in a sustainable way. So like no, you know, foundation for the house or no, like, you know, greasy uh, mm -hmm. kind of materials. So we contacted tons of people and no one wanted to help us. Everyone's like, okay, are you insane? This is just not going to happen. So we went to Lithuania and we found a person who said, cool, I'm going to build you the house that you want. Cool. So they built the house, uh, shipped it over like, you know, they took, you know, they PCC. rented track. So this uh -huh. whole house was just like moved to Denmark. Then we found someone who was able to build it in the woods in the way we wanted. Um, so it was like a diverse group of people that helped us out. And now it's a thriving business. So, you know, people are reaching out saying, hey, I also want to spend three days in the middle of the woods. Um, so it's just, you know, that's just to illustrate that my creativity and my husband's creativity came together and we actually did something really fun. Uh, mm -hmm. But I wouldn't be able to do it by myself, you know, mm -hmm. and vice versa. I don't think he would be able to do it by himself without me. So yeah. that's how I get Great. to be creative. Nice. And, and, but, but now coming back to your current role mm -hmm. at uh, WS Audiology, um, it's about diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I know, Carolina, we already had a lot of like interaction and chats about that topic, but mm -hmm. I'm really curious about your perspective on like, do you see any link between what we're just discussing about creativity as, let's say, a human ability and what you're now trying to foster the topic of diversity, equity, and inclusion? Any, any links you see? Maybe to jump in here, yes. can you maybe also first of all give a very short intro oh, yeah. of what you're actually doing there? Yeah. So because there are many I'm words sorry. in there of <laughs> diversity, equity, inclusion, and culture. So what is it all about, and then how it connects mm. to creativity? Yeah. So um, I think it's a good idea with quick introduction of what diversity, equity, and inclusion means. Uh, especially for people who are not, you know, who are not uh, um, introduced to the topic before. So I will start with some very quick, short definitions. And in the DEI, as we call it, world, we like to use um, a shoe metaphor. So I hope you are all ready for it, mm -hmm. but it really explains uh, what it is. So if you think about diversity, it's like having a shoe rack. So you're like in you know, in the store and you're looking at different types of shoes. So we have sneakers, sandals, heels, boots, whatever you can imagine. Mm -hmm. 
And in the mm-hmm. context of diversity, it's like having a wide range of people with different skills, different experiences. Um, so it is all about, when it comes to diversity, about recognizing our differences. And it can be anything from visible traits, like, let's say, I don't know, our uh, race or age or, mm-hmm. uh, you know, ethnicity, whatever that can be, to things that are not very visible to us, such as, I don't know, our religion, our diversity of thought, um, the ways we work, all of those things. So that's diversity. So that's like, you know, this shoe rack with all the shoes you can imagine. And then we have equity. So equity is about, um, it's like a metaphor on um, that each person has a different shoe size, right? So we all need to make sure that the shoes that we buy are our size, otherwise it won't fit. So it really acknowledges that, you know, the people, they have different needs and circumstances. So by providing equity in my work, I really try to offer the necessary support, um, resources, opportunities um, to really ensure that everyone has equal chance to succeed, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, so uh, so this is how mm-hmm. I would describe equity. Uh, so, so for example... on the very different level of skills or trades or whatever you just mentioned. Yeah, exactly. So for example, if you, uh, you know, let's say I offer, so because people confuse equity and equality quite a lot of the time. So the very basic example is I'm going to offer um, a training session on project management in German. Mm-hmm. So obviously you two will be able to join the session. I wouldn't only because I don't speak German. But, you know, offering the same thing to everyone, that's equality. But mm-hmm. equity would be offering this course in English so that, you know, I could also join. Mm-hmm. Uh, so this is this is the difference. And of course, inclusion, it's all about, you know, if we are still in the shoe metaphor, that you get a really nice experience in the store where you're respected. People ask about your needs. People want to hear what you have to say. So this is all about inclusion. And that's the reason why... Diversity is, you know, something sometimes when we look at companies, they want to acquire a lot of diverse profiles. However, diversity cannot thrive if there is no inclusion, if there is no equity. So that's the reason why it is diversity, equity and inclusion. Mm -hmm. And then the last piece, of course, is the culture. So how do you make sure that you have a company culture that is welcoming towards everyone? Mm -hmm. Um, So that is basically what I'm doing. I'm trying to retain, I'm trying to um, attract diverse profiles while also making sure they have equal opportunities. They have, they all have opportunities to develop, to succeed and feel respected, included, psychologically safe. So, uh, yeah, I, uh, I work with a lot of different functions because obviously it's not just me doing it. It's like a full team of people behind it. One more question before we d- talk about the connection to creativity. Can you maybe make it a bit more concrete on what or like have examples on what exactly you're doing? Because you said you're you're trying to make that real, like bringing diversity, inclusion, all this stuff in there. But how? L- just like one or two little examples you could share on what you're doing. Uh, I'm trying to think of something because it's such a big, yeah. uh, big, big thing. So, um, so what I'm doing personally with my team. So I cover the global aspect. So I create strategies. I create, uh, different, um, policies. So I'm trying to enable our, you know, people teams, our leaders to attract and retain diversity so mm-hmm. diverse profiles uh, and I do the same for the inclusion piece so I'm trying to teach I'm trying to educate people on how to develop inclusive environment how to be you know aware of their unconscious biases so you know all the prejudice that we you know all of us have against other people because it's you know it's so ingrained in our brains so it's difficult to say into words what it is that I'm doing um, yeah. because it is just like one big collaboration with yeah. All types of different teams. I think one major thing you just mentioned is creating this kind of awareness and education, especially on what mm. it exactly is and why we need it mm. and how it works and what kind of impact in the end it will bring to each and every one individual. 
I think that's one very important part, right? Yes. Okay, so now let's, Toby, ask your question. <laughs> no, no, please. Now you can ask the question. <laughs> so now as, we're wondering what's the connectivity to um, creativity. So do you, have you worked with this topic already also in the, in your environment, at your workplace? Is this already a topic you touched upon? Uh, so I, um, I have worked with the topic but not consciously. So, you know, in a, in a lot of companies, we talk about innovation, uh, but we rarely talk about creativity. So, so, you know, all the research that you can find there would tell you that diverse teams tend to be more innovative, mm. more creative. And this is something I've been working quite a lot with. Um, and it is simply because, you know, creativity thrives when people have different opinions, different ways of working. They challenge each other. Um, and it was when I met uh, Tobias where we talked about creativity specifically. So not just innovation, which is the, you know, output, but actually what is happening before. And I don't think I have been that aware of the topic before I actually met him. And we dive, you know, drove into uh, into the topic even more. Um, but there is there are so many connections. Um, I don't again. I don't know what research you have, uh, you have read, but I, you know, if you have a homogenous environment where people all the same, same ideas, I don't know how easy it is for that team of people to be creative. Yeah. Um, I, I actually also learned a lot, Carolina, while we had this discussion, because I never thought that I want to that I will talk about creativity and diversity equity inclusion at some point, but mm. we definitely found out together that, mm. uh, I mean, diversity is actually, of course, not actually, of course, but actually a topic that is well researched in the field of creativity, because of course, if you want to create something mm. new and you want to think mm. in different new directions, having a broad set of different perspectives coming together mm. is of course broadening, broadening your new, like, let's say solution space, your new, new, new thinking space, let's say, right? Yes. But of course, this is again the challenge. You cannot, as mm. which, what you were saying, uh, uh, Carolina, that if you just put a diverse set of people in one room, but you're not like build the equity inclusion and, and not act on that, you're never able to harness this potential that lies within this diversity for potentially a very creative output, mm. right? Because it might be just one very strong character in, in this mm, setup, mm. right? That is ruling the the workshop, let's say. So it's yep. always also about those those balancing things in a workshop setup for creating something new. So I definitely mm. believe that th there's a close connection between setting up diversity, equity, inclusion, bringing that basically to life and harness mm. it through creativity for something new. But at the same time, I also strongly believe that if you train your creative muscle, you learn about your personal creativity, about your boxes in your head and all that, that this mm. is also helping you to like open up more and better to diversity, equity, inclusion, and also bring your, let's say, like piece into the game and help to make that happen. Mm. So it's like a back and forth connection, which I see actually. Mm. So I don't know if you agree on that. Yeah, I do agree because, you know, diversity is tricky and that's what a lot of companies, you know, they, they make the mistake of acquiring a lot of diversity because they want yes, to meet quotas yes. or whatever, yeah. but they are not prepared to actually invest in the inclusion piece or the equity piece. Uh, and that's where the diversity is not sustainable because, you know, yeah. people will leave or, you know, as it, exactly as you say, Tobias, um, if you put, you know, a group of people, very different people in one room and say, go innovate, you know, the chances of them ending up in disagreements and conflicts is very high. So the real, you know, key to really unlock creativity, it is inclusion and it is equity. And so as soon as few people feel hurt and they feel psychologically safe and they feel respected and celebrated, that's when, you know, our differences become the mm -hmm. team's biggest asset. Yeah. Uh, and that's, you know, I think in inclusive environments, that's where diverse, you know, uh, viewpoints are valued and then creativity just grows. Yeah. Um, it's not an so easy I, thing. Yeah. No, it's not because, you know, one thing is I've been thinking about it. You can be the most self-aware person and you can, you know, be aware of how to train your brain and be more creative. But if you are in a room of people 
mm-hmm. who won't allow you to be yeah. yourself and they won't allow you to just, you know, be free and just share ideas, at some point you will either leave the team or you will shut down. Mm-hmm. So, and that's the reason why I see such a big connection between your work on creativity and my work on inclusive environments. Yeah. Do you see any like specific example already in, in your career, but also probably in your current role mm-hmm. where you experience that promoting diversity and inclusion has led to any like emergence of creative solutions, ideas, or any like push into mm-hmm. that direction? Um, yes, I've seen quite a lot. Uh, of course, I don't, I, you know, I will not share specific products just in case. Of course. <laughs> of course. But um, I think the, the example that a lot of people can relate to um, is, uh, is around um, marketing. So the importance of diverse teams in marketing. So if you have a team that needs to develop a campaign or yeah. create a campaign, it is really important uh, that this team is diverse because, you know, um, some of the most innovative some of the most like captivating campaigns that i have seen personally uh, were you know created by diverse teams uh, on the contrary campaigns led by less diverse teams often you know end up in you know reputational damage so we've mm. seen you know companies like you know big giants like zara or h&m mm-hmm. where they create a campaign that is extremely offensive um and, you know, I cannot know for sure, obviously, because I haven't worked for those companies, but I would assume that they were missing someone in that room when they mm-hmm. made a decision, this is a good idea, who would have told them, you know what, it's actually not. Mm-hmm. Uh, so this is where I think it's a very concrete example that I've seen throughout my career. In, um, yeah. And, and um, yeah. Do, do you have also any specific examples? How do you actually... Like, what are your initiatives, programs, formats, things you do to actually stimulate this organization to a little bit more diversity? Let, but let's say diversity is something that is already on the table for a lot of companies mm-hmm. because you were, were saying like they are acquiring a lot of diversity. But mm-hmm. let's probably focus rather on equ- equity inclusion. So how do you, as as global head of diversity, mm-hmm. equity, inclusion, stimulate the organization mm-hmm. or like mm-hmm. nudge it towards more equity inclusion? Any mm-hmm. Anything you can share? That is a nice like takeaway for people listening. I know it's a tough question. But. Yeah, um, I think I do. So I really, truly believe um, that everyone's input and mm-hmm. viewpoint is valuable. Mm-hmm. And, you know, as long as it's shared respectfully, obviously. Uh, but, you know, just because your values uh, are not aligned with mine, doesn't mean that you're wrong or I'm wrong, you know, it's just, you know, it's just a difference of opinion. And I think that's what goes wrong quite a lot in the world of diversity, that we become very polarized and we just, you know, we just feel like my opinion is the right opinion. If you disagree, then I'm not going to listen. And that's where creativity dies. So one of the biggest part of my job and why I try to teach our leaders is to just, you know, say, you, uh, you don't know everything. Mm -hmm but you have a team of people that can help you understand uh, how to move forward with a certain, you know, problem or whatever there is. And you need to be open to it, open to feedback, open to new ideas. Um, And, you know, also, and I know that I've said it before, but fostering the psychological safety. So one advice I would always give to people is to just, whenever you get that feeling in your gut where you feel like, Ooh, I don't like that person, but you don't know why, right? You have zero uh, evidence on why you wouldn't like that person. It is a sign that it is your bias kicking in and you need to ask yourself, okay, why am I feeling the way I'm feeling? And try to challenge yourself a little bit uh, because very often um, we, we react that way, a very unfair way towards individuals that... Um, Think differently that are different from us because you know it's the unknown and we as you know humans are wired to be afraid of the unknown mm-hmm. um so that would be my one of my at least advice so just yeah so you you actually work a lot with leaders so you have specific like let's say training programs with leaders or how do you how do you stimulate those people to adapt this, yeah. this view and, and bring that to their own teams 
So yes, I train leaders on inclusive leadership and the way I structured my program, and I'm not saying is, you know, it's better than anybody else's, but what I truly believe is that people need to understand that diversity is not about everybody else. Mm. It's about you as well. And this is missed. You know, that's the point that we are missing quite a lot in, uh, in diversity conversations because you know, there is a pool of people that feel left out. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it is my job to make sure that they understand, you know, just because we are the same, I don't know, race or gender doesn't mean we are the same, right? So Bianca and I, yes, we are two white females. Are we the same? No. So, so this is also where, so I start with that, like, where are you in diversity? What does it mean to you? What are the experiences that you've had throughout your life that shaped you to who you are? And then when we have that understanding of ourselves um, and and realize where we are on, on the scale, we can move on into a conversation about, you know, privilege. And I know a lot of people hate that word. <laughs> uh, you can also say unearned advantages. So things that we didn't earn, we just were born into certain circumstances. And it's also very important to understand that sometimes we are taking it for granted that some people work three times as hard to achieve the same thing that we have, right? Mm -hmm. So it is also a difficult, you know, conversation sometimes with leaders because they need to realize that there are people on their teams that, you know, had different circumstances in their lives. Uh, And they need to really think about in terms of equity. Mm -hmm. How do you elevate those people? How do you help? How do you develop them, right? Because you cannot offer everyone the same thing because not everyone needs the same thing. Uh, we are all very different, right? We have individualistic needs. So that's the second part. And then we talk about, you know, our prejudice, our unconscious biases. It can be a very uncomfortable discussion. But when we are aware of why we react the way we do, it's much easier to acknowledge, oh, wow, okay, I was not aware. I will try to do my best. And also saying, you know, we all have bias. We all do. It's not something we can, you know, run away from. So uh, making sure that this is clear. And the last part is I offer tools to our leaders. So I offer them uh, concrete things they can do to uh, to be more aware, to stop. And I think that's where Tobias and I, I think we would agree, is that people need to stop and think. Because when you react on your gut feeling, when you react on your impulse, very yes. often it's an unfair or a bad decision that you're going to make, right? Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's right. You never know, but you need to stop. Uh, And it is, it's actually one of the biggest challenges of the leaders I've seen throughout my career. They are so busy. They have so many deadlines. Mm -hmm. They are so under pressure. So slowing down, a lot of them just look at me and think, my goodness, woman, it's just impossible. It's not going (laughs) to happen. Uh, But in order to change behavior, you need to stop. You need to give yourself time. Yeah, I, I like that picture. And just just you, one yeah. one quick, quick example for the listeners, because I mean, just to give an example of what you were just saying, uh, Carolina, is that if I have a really bad experience, let's say with someone who was called Bianca, and then I meet this Bianca here in the room, the very first time, I definitely have an unconscious bias, a negative, let's say, uh, unconscious bias towards Bianca because I had a negative experience just because of the name. And I think that's nothing bad. That's also what I keep telling to the pe- people. Don't say that's bad and blame someone because just be aware of it that you always, the simplest thing, just the name of someone with a bad experience connected probably can already like create a negative attitude towards the next mm-hmm. person that has the same name, but doesn't do anything uh, negative mm-hmm. in that sense. Right. So you have created a pattern. That's always the connection of like how our brain works. And that's what I love to use in, in, in workshops regarding creativity, that you create a pattern with an experience up here in your head. That's just how we work. But you need to be aware that mm-hmm. this bad pattern needs to be refined, reworked. And that is hard work. It's easier for us to stick to that pattern. And that is also leading us towards this like denial of something new, right? Mm-hmm. Because you have a negative experience with that, whatever, or this unconscious reaction to something. I think that's mm-hmm. just very important. And the same happens if you are confronted with a task regarding innovation or creativity. Think about the new car of the future, right? If you just hear the word car, you definitely start to imagine First of all, with what a car is today, right? So you're stuck in the box of what a car is today, and then you struggle to really build it into the future. So sometimes you need to stop and think what you are saying and ask, 
why do I react like that? And understand that it's just the name, the negative experience, but it has nothing to do with this new person here in the room, right? And at the same time on the side with a car of the future, stop and think and ask, hey, the initial um, goal is not a car. The initial goal is, let's say, mobility, mm. right? And then you're able to open up and think in new avenues and be, be really yeah. creative. So I think that's a nice link how our brain is working between approaching an innovation topic, but also there's this unconscious bias of, of denial of someone. Mm. But sorry, Bianca, you wanted to ask also something. Absolutely. No, you can first add something to that, Carolina. <laughs> Yeah, so I think it was a great example of unconscious bias. And of course, there are tons of those biases. But what you just described to bias is basically um, ways that we were taught the world is working, our, you know, traumas, all of those things, they sit so, you know, in our brain subconsciously. And that's what we are reacting to. So, you know, you can also, think- you probably... A lot of people have seen one of the very clear bias uh, examples where you have teams of people mm-hmm. that seem the same, right? Because we have, it's called affinity bias. So it means that when you meet someone like yourself and automatically you like the person. You don't know why, but you yeah. like the person, right? So, yeah, sorry, and I, I think, cut you off. No, 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 it's, it's totally fine. I just wanted to add, and the thing is that it's fine that we react that, like that. We're not, we're not here to blame. The only thing is be aware of that because that's just how our brain works. Because if we use our patterns, which are already there, we just consume less energy, Right. But refining patterns, refining old experience, refining this and opening up for new and like, yeah, change that perspective of something that costs you way more energy. Right. So this, this is, in my point of view, very important because otherwise we go back to this blaming of each other. And I think that will not change anything, but really accepting and understanding how we people work and how our brain is working and then accept that, but work with that and be more like in a positive attitude to say, Hey, Bianca, I remind you right now towards your bias, which I just observed last week, whatever, right? So be very conscious about that and help each other to remind about that. Because I think in the end, it's also way better to do that in a team and, and help each other out and not just just mm-hmm. rely on yourself. Of course, it's also important mm-hmm. to reflect within yourself, basically, and your own experiences mm-hmm. and your own behavior, right? But also in a team, it's it's a very powerful tool to, to yeah. Lend. It is. But it could only work if there is psychological safety. So, you know, the thing is that, you know, I think a lot of those things that you mentioned, I agree. There is nothing wrong with bias. We all have it. So it's just a fact. And we, we, we need to start being more aware of those that are hurting other people. Because, you know, just because I like the color green, you know, it's not hurting anyone. Uh, but I think what is also very important that if you want to work with unconscious bias in your team, there needs to be a certain level of trust because otherwise you will end up in the blaming culture and you know shame is the thing that i don't work with so you know i would never want anyone to feel ashamed of anything um so trust uh, and it takes time again it takes time so as you say it's a you know fine line between calling out someone else's bias and helping them to just like overcome it i had a question regarding what you just said also with leadership And you also mentioned now it takes time. So you, for example, do also workshops and different initiatives with leaders to create this kind of awareness and also on reflecting on um, the different topics. But I'm still wondering how can you create this sustainable impact of it? So how can we not just have like little workshops and trying to create the awareness, but how... Because you said that was like the perfect fit. It takes time. How can we make sure that this is really that the leaders take it within their teams and it's gonna, it's, it's gonna become active, but sustainably? How, how do we solve this challenge? Um, I don't think anyone has solved the challenge yet, to be very honest, because otherwise we would have had perfect uh, work environments everywhere. Um, so, what we are, you know, what I've been doing in my career is so, of course, the workshops, um, nudging is very, you know, it's actually very good. So like, you know, I don't know if you've read the book Atomic Habits, kind of a thing where you just simply embed some of those small uh, behavioral changes into your everyday life. Mm-hmm. So, uh, um, but, um, but to be honest, the inclusive leadership that it's not the way I work 
is not just, you know, me teaching people about it and that's it. So inclusiveness is embedded into, you know, not just uh, WSL ideology, but in a lot of companies, into the values, into the behaviors we expect people to show, into the training materials. So sometimes we don't explicitly talk about it, but it's still there. Uh, so, so there are very different techniques, but I would say nudging is pretty good uh, if you can, you know, do it in the correct way. It's just like, because I'm also thinking some, because sometimes this is also not sometimes, but like in general, this is a very also personal topic because we are also talking about feelings. You talk about gut feeling, you talk about your experiences and it's very individual and personal. So I can imagine some people, they do not even want to open up and they are not that open-minded mm -hmm. to really be inclusive and promote mm -hmm. diversity mm -hmm. and all this stuff mm -hmm. so i'm i'm big of i'm a big fan of the discussion you have and i think that's all important but still there are so many people that maybe do not really understand why and how and how do you bring these people also on the journey or do we just accept it that mm -hmm. it's like that so, again, back to my point, lack of polari polarization helps. So you need to, you know, understand that each, let's say, of the regions in the world see diversity differently. So what diversity means to, let's say, me comparing to someone in Japan can be very different. So uh, in terms of the resistance, yes, there are, of course, groups of people that resist. But the question is, why do they resist? Mm -hmm. They resist because they're excluded. Mm. It's because they feel like they are being shamed for something, you know, they haven't done. So I had many leaders saying, why, you know, I, I am born as a white middle-aged male. Well, now, you know, why am I being like excluded from all the things that are happening around? Why do I have to feel ashamed of, you know, some things that other people has done? And this is, these are the important conversations because people are not saying no you know, we can all agree that inclusion is important, right? We all want everyone to feel safe. We all, we want everyone to feel respected. Um, but the key is to try to, you know, get that group of people that resist to actually help us drive that and try to understand what is there for them, mm. right? Because, you know, just because I believe it's, it's, you know, it's, it's important doesn't mean that somebody mm. else does. So this is where we need to bring those people on the journey. And there are several uh, techniques, but the most effective one is, is you know, it's open dialogue. So I have colleagues, you know, um, you know, I had a lot of colleagues throughout my career saying, you know, because of my religious beliefs, I will never, ever support pride. Mm -hmm. And and, you know, and they said so which and they they would, you know, carry on and say, so I cannot support your agenda. And then my answer would always be by why not? You don't have to celebrate pride. But the only thing I'm asking you to do is to respect your colleagues from that community and, you know, make them feel welcomed. And, and, and then, you know, the response would be, oh, but I already do that. It's like, okay, good. <laughs> then we agree. Inclusion is important. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's sometimes about like the definition. I think it's, you know, what you read in the media, what you read on LinkedIn. It is very, very polarized. So diversity, inclusion is just sometimes feels like we're moving into this sphere of politics mm -hmm. where you're either against or for and there is no against or for it's just like you know it's it's about all of us and that's what sometimes you know can be a little bit difficult so open conversation and never ever shut people down unless they are threatening unless they are you know doing something really awful then yes <laughs> then then this is where where you know you have you have your boundary but if people are respectful and they just want to discuss Just be open and just say, okay, let me understand your perspective and mm -hmm. let me elaborate on mine. All that is also super important for creative processes. What I see there is that people are shut down, not because of like biases, sometimes because they are just expressing, let's say, their diverse sets of ideas and thoughts, right? Sometimes they are shut mm -hmm. down in the creative process because it just takes more time to manage like a mm -hmm. very diverse set of ideas and come back to the one single solution, right? So... But I think there are a lot of like um, similarities in, in, in the endeavor to really foster that. And I think 
you actually need to bring both into an organization, diversity, equity, inclusion, that's super important, but also an understanding of creativity in the end. And I think that can mm. help each other to really thrive. Basically goes hand in hand, I would say, right? Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. It goes hand in hand. And, Wonderful. And I think what you just, yeah. So I think it was a good conclusion to bias. So just like, you know, let people express themselves and, you know, and then have a conversation and just try to find a solution without just like shutting everyone down because that's not the point. Yeah, it just needs needs a little bit more time, right? And that's sometimes a thing mm. we don't have in our business life, honestly, right? So we're super busy. Yeah. We need to deliver fast. Uh, but really bringing that to life takes time and we need mm. to take that time for us and believe into the longer let's say, long time um, benefit of it, that if you foster diversity inclusion, you make that open dialogue, look, to, you, you bring people into the conversation and listen to that perspective, right? If you do that, that will, and that is probably a nice link why we need the topic of creati creativity in the picture of diversity and inclusion, because then you can say, hey, if you do that, it takes more time now, but in the long term, you have a better, let's say, uh, innovation KPI coming out. You're more innovative. Innovative in the end, you, you bring better products to life, more, uh, let's say, more value for the customer that will increase your revenue and stuff. So you have through this argumentation, you probably have a nice not argumentation, um, uh, yeah, like set of, of yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah, but Bridge. also Thank not you. just maybe not just even those hard facts. Also, when it comes course, to humans, I mean, also personally, I think it can yeah. give you so much and you can give others so much when you start being open and including people or like hearing what others are saying and building this kind of psychological safety. I think uh, when I experienced this uh, during my work, sometimes I, I really felt so well like comfortable with the people also around me i was even it makes you happier somehow in your workplace and that is so important because we spend so much time at our workplaces and therefore it's even better to yeah. actually feel better as a human being yeah i can actually also make a point or maybe also kind of like an advice uh to companies because throughout my career I have seen like a lot of top management really claiming their devotion to creativity and, you know, to innovation. But at the same time, they were very risk averse. Mm. And, you know, and this is what leads to the disappointment, you know, among employees who really try to push boundaries. Um, but, you know, they end up banging their heads on the wall. Mm. So I really see a shift in uh, the workforce right now. Mm -hmm. So the people that are entering the workforce, they are often more interested in, you know, psychological safety, creativity, you know, being able to express themselves. Um, so they seek environments that encourage, you know, challenging outdated norms, if you can say it that way. Um, so I really think, you know, one of the advice would be to, if you devote yourself to creativity if you claim that innovation is one of your top priorities you need to give people time to be creative to explore um walk the because talk. if you put walk the talk you know and don't put tight deadlines and yeah. you know and group of i don't know engineers in the room and say hey go innovate you had three hours it's not how it works mm -hmm. so this is also you know like a paradox um that I've seen in my career. And I think it's really sad. Um, and, and I think, you know, if you give people time and especially in terms of diversity, um, you know, it's great, you know, creativity and diversity is great for business. That's what you can, you know, see in all the research, but you have to be ready to invest in it because, you know, nothing good comes out for free. And it's not just one side project. It's something that you constantly need to include that you need to reflect on it's a constant mm. journey and not just this is ah uh, by the way we also do that and we now now let's bring some diversity into this project so this is not how it's gonna work no no exactly so uh i agree yeah <laughs> Great, such an important uh, topic. I could uh, listen to you <laughs> for ages because I also have experienced some of those things um, that you also just mentioned, actually, uh, during my work time. Like this kind of paradox where you, people or leaders actually think 
hey, we we have to be creative. You you can be open. You can say whatever you want to say. But in the end, when you do this, it's kind of not correct or like they do not want to see it. So they yeah. do not really stick to what they're actually saying. But sometimes I cannot even, I don't, sometimes I don't even think they do it consciously. They actually do not even know about it because they do not even reflect on it. Because this is like their normal behavior. Maybe they want to be open and they want to promote it, but they somehow, they do not even realize what they're doing in the end. And this is also a huge challenge mm -hmm. where this kind of reflecting, mm -hmm. make, bringing this awareness into the game, mm -hmm. this constant, yeah. I say the word again, reflection, I think is very crucial. It What is, it is. Um, I can share a very, very short mm -hmm. uh you know, like, um, just an example on exactly what you just said. So I, um, I have a team and, uh, it's a very creative team. So again, that's probably my bias and my affinity <laughs> towards uh, creative people, but we, we did something very smart, um, when we started working together and I can really recommend it to everyone who listens to the podcast, if they're part of a team, um, so we talked about the open communication. So since my team is very creative, they really thrive when they are given the freedom to share, you know, ideas and they need to dream big and they want to explore new possibilities. And on the other hand, we have, you, have, you know, they have me as their leader in their team. And I have, you know, this responsibility to ensure that we meet our deadlines mm -hmm. and then we deliver on our priorities. And what I found out because they were so open with me, they basically said that I tend to push them to execution mode mm. way too quickly, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. So I suffocate mm -hmm. their creativity. And it was such an interesting feedback uh, because I was thinking, you know, that I'm doing the right thing, yeah. right? Because I need to meet my deadline. But they were, you know, feeling I was expecting something impossible mm -hmm. from them. So, you know, the key, I think, takeaway here is that, you know, because my team, they feel safe to voice their concerns. And it was not, you know, it was, it was nothing ne negative towards me. It was just a reflection yeah. on how we work as a team. So we decided that we need to strike a balance. Mm -hmm. So um, we need to find a way how to have time to be creative and innovative and, you know, meet our deadlines. And that's where I think I need to be better at extending mm -hmm. some of the deadlines. You know, I'm, we're not saving lives. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if I extend deadline with one week, I don't think anyone would, <laughs> you know, has something against it. Uh, so, so I can really recommend to have those open and honest conversations and create ground rules for the team so mm -hmm. they can, you know, we can hold each other accountable. Yeah. This open dialogue. And you actually created this space that people actually are able to say it, to say it to you and are not scared of opening and opening up and telling mm -hmm. you, Hey, you're moving us into the execution mode. Yeah. So I think it's, of course, it's also a culture thing, right? Mm. So there are certain cultures where it will be very difficult for people to challenge me that way. Mm. But if you have someone in your team that can take on the role of someone who can speak on behalf of the team and give that mm. honest feedback, uh, it really works well, in my opinion. Uh, because sometimes le as leaders, we... We are not, you know, mean people that, you know, want to suffocate someone's creativity. We are just, you know, we are normal people. We are busy. There are high expectations of us. We also, you know, some of us have families. And, you know, there are so many things happening. We need that feedback because yeah. it's not always easy to just reflect um, and think about, oh, what have I done today? And was it good? Was it, you know, it's, yeah. you know, we are a team. I'm not a dictator, yeah. you know, <laughs> or just the humans. queen of the team. <laughs> We are humans. I'm trying to lead the yeah. team in the right direction, but they also need to tell me sometimes if uh, I'm derailing them simply into a direction they don't want to go yeah. or they don't find, you know, productive. Yeah. And was it that the team in your case um, came up to you with the feedback themselves or was this like a feedback session or anything or was this just someone bringing it, it up? I'm asking this question because mm. um, some. Sometimes maybe also people are very scared of sharing feedback in general and they're kind of waiting for the leader, for example, to create that's create a feedback session or something like that. But sometimes that does not even take place. 
So um, how was it in, in your case? And would you also recommend to create this kind of feedback sessions or should people or do you really promote just share the feedback or the open dialogue? So it depends on the team and mm -hmm. also depends on who's in your team. So, you know, there are, you know, there are certain individuals that will not share their feedback openly. Uh, and they are not, it's not natural for them to just speak up mm. and challenge. Uh, so I think having like a feedback form where, you know, people can share opinions is always good. The problem is if the team is very small, mm. right? Because that's where, you know, there are also leaders that don't take feedback very well. Mm. So this is where I recommend coaching. But in my case, I was, you know, Uh, it was just, it was actually a meeting where we discussed uh, opportunities for developing uh, an idea, like, like, you know, an event. And, you know, there was someone who was just saying, okay, and we could do this, this and that. And, you know, and, and, and this person went into like different directions. So because I was busy and I was not perhaps in my very calm mindset mm -hmm. that day, I said, no, 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 this is not possible. We don't have time. Use that idea. Go. Mm -hmm. And that's where I think this person got a little bit frustrated. Yeah. <laughs> and they said, you need to stop derailing me mm. and you need to stop killing my creativity. And that's, you know, where mm. the team, but it's because this person feels very, you know, comfortable challenging yeah, yeah, yeah. me because that's, that's the environment we decided we want. Uh, but I'm not saying it will work for everyone. Uh, it was just, it was working for me. Yeah. Because uh, I, uh, then in the end as well. So it's, It is very individual, but as you mentioned, there has to be, you know, some kind of like feedback session, feedback form. As a leader, you need to not be, a, you know, afraid of getting feedback. Yeah. You know, the reason why we are, you know, in the leadership seat is because we need to, we guide people, right? We need to find direction. And if you're not able to listen, it's a recipe for failure. Um, so it's very uncomfortable. But, you know, that's, uh, that's the reality of the job, yeah. unfortunately. It's, uh, if you are not comfortable with getting feedback, perhaps leadership is not, not the right thing. path yeah. for you. Yeah. But it's my personal opinion, yeah, yeah. so not to offend anyone. I really hope <laughs> no one will, you know, come after me. But it's just like self-reflection and being able to, to take in feedback is an important leadership skill. Yeah, definitely, right? definitely. So important. And I, I, I'm sure nobody will feel off offended by this because we always talk about perspectives, <laughs> personal perspectives here in this podcast. But thank you so much, Carolina. Actually, I just wanted to have like one <laughs> short last question, but I somehow always have a new question in my mind. So thanks a lot for sharing Go ahead. your experiences. <laughs> but this is really the last question. I mean, you have already given a lot of recommendations, um, in this podcast, which is highly valuable for our listeners but what is like the very last thing wrapping this all up what kind of advice would you give our listeners when it comes to creativity so being creative individually or for themselves i think I, i'm i'm repeating myself a little bit but It's okay <laughs> main advice is to And, and, you know, I find it difficult myself, mm -hmm. so I know it's not easy, but try to slow down. Try to, you know, don't get overwhelmed by deadlines, checklists, meetings, and just try to schedule some time in your diary. I don't know, hour, two hours, whatever, you know, your time allows you to just be creative. And, you know, and, and mm -hmm. I think for me, you know, I like to see things visually, so I will draw, mm -hmm. I would, you know, do something... Uh, but because I am the way I am, I'm a very structured person and, and I, unfortunately, I thrive mm -hmm. when it comes to deadlines and things like that. <laughs> I need to schedule my creative time. Yeah. I cannot just take it out of my diary. So I like to plan. I know some people can be more uh, spontaneous about it. And, you know, it can be anything, going for a walk, mm -hmm. um, whatever works for you, but scheduling this time so you have it in your diary. And, and just like try to make it sacred so no one can book you or no one can call you, just like switch off. So that would be my advice, number one. So that's for you and your own self-reflection. Mm -hmm. But if you are a leader or if you work in a team where you, you know, you need to be creative with other people, rule number one, don't be afraid of something that's different. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and try to really give voice to every single person in the room. 
And if someone is not saying something, it's not because they don't have anything to say. Yeah. It's probably because they don't know how to phrase it or they don't feel safe. So try to, you know, talk to the person, try to encourage them to share their ideas so everyone is hurt. Um, so, so yeah, that's my advice. Don't be afraid of difference and just like give everyone a voice, even though you disagree with them, you know, yeah. then you've learned something new. Yeah. You'll just, yeah, as you said, learn something new, maybe develop even further. Lovely. Exactly. Exactly. So that's why I love global environments and big companies, because yeah. that's like a, you know, melting pot of definitely different people, definitely. like with different experiences. And I find it personally fascinating, but I also absolutely understand and appreciate that some people find it overwhelming. Yeah. Uh, I mean, so Siemens yeah, has like 300,000 employees. I mean, I'm not working with all of those people, but I encounter a lot of different people. I work with a lot of different people and you, you do not mm. always have to be the same opinion on the same page with everyone, but you have to listen at least and accept what is there. And this is the best basis mm. to, to, or like the ground to work even further, work mm. better. And in the end, also be happy in your job. Exactly. And you develop, right? Yeah, if you yeah. never listen to anyone, if you don't yeah. like, you know, take some advice from people, you will never develop. Yeah. So you know, if you think about you being as a child, like how many advices did yeah. we get, you know, since we were born and people were telling us, do this, do that, maybe this is better. And then, you know, you start to, I don't know, balance out what people are telling you and what you learn by yourself. Yeah. And that's how you develop. So just be open um, and don't be scared. Yeah. And I know it's natural to be scared, mm -hmm. uh, but it's not always beneficial to us, especially, you know, those who work with creativity. Um, yeah. It's important that you just, you know, you you are able to to sometimes get a little bit closer to the yeah. edge. <laughs> I love that. Without jumping, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> yes, for sure. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you, Carolina. 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 <laughs> Yes, you yeah. know, people call me different things. <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> Casey, thank you so much. This was like a really great discussion. I think you're doing something very important or you're pushing something very, very important that we need even more in companies, but, but also individually for ourselves, <laughs> for our people. Thank you so much for sharing your experiences thank you. in this podcast. I'm 100% sure that this will be valuable for many other people, for our listeners. And have a great day. Thank you so much for having me. It's been great getting to know you and having this chat. It's uh, energizing on a Friday afternoon. Yes. So, uh, take care. <laughs> Thank you. Bye.